Livingston Taylor, welcome. How are you doing? Jeff, I am so well. So great to speak with you. Excellent. And yeah, it's good to see you too. It's been a while. It has been a while. Oh, the COVID. The COVID's putting us back on the digital format. So I'm looking forward to this being over and my seeing your beautiful face in person. Well, such as it is. How, I guess one of the things that when I think of you, I always think about your just constant sunny disposition and how are you able to maintain that, especially during, let's call them trying times. You know, these are trying times and uh, I have anxiety and fear along with everybody else. But one of the things that uh, it, it, it it's important to um, have a sense of, uh, of gratitude, obviously, and, uh, and understand that um, we are being um, aggressively stimulated by uh, news media, et cetera, by many forces that have, uh, that profit and benefit from our anxiety. Um, so uh, it's important to take a deep breath periodically and look at things. I think the best thing to do is to look at things statistically. Um, uh, don't lose the soul of the moment, but by the same token, um, uh, take a statistical look at what is liable to happen to you and uh, behave accordingly. And so much of who you are is from the live performance of music, not just the recordings. How are you able to, how are you adapting to this less opportunity for live music? Well, uh, frankly, I'm not adapting very well. I'm, I'm practicing a lot of music. Uh, I'm thinking about how to get back in front of my audience, how to get back with my people. I miss them like crazy. And uh, uh, it's, it's been, uh, for me and for all of us, that has been a real struggle. And, and uh, uh, frankly, uh, what I find is, uh, I find myself waking up very early in the morning and, uh, and, missing the opportunity to be who I am. And above all else, what I am is a live performer, a live entertainer. And so I see you started doing, is it once a week, a uh, digital show? How has that been for you? Yes, I've been doing the Livingston Taylor show once a week. That has been a godsend for me to just know that my uh, audience is on the other side and I, and I, uh, uh, you want to hear my theme song? Sure. Sure. Here it comes. Here's the theme song for the Livingston Taylor Show. Okay, here it comes. It's the Livingston Taylor Show. It's the Livingston Taylor Show. You never know where it's gonna go. It's the Livingston Taylor Show. Is he crashing in a car? Is he wrecking in a plane? Does he even understand that the devil loves to rain? Is he casually eccentric or actually insane? What stork brought that brain? It's the Livingston Taylor Show. It's the Livingston Taylor Show. We're out of time. We gotta go. We'll be back next Tuesday, I know. We're gonna turn on the tap. Oh, let it flow. It's the Livingston Taylor Show. Nice. Ah! It sort of reminds me of what you would see on like a, a TV show. Yes. 
Oh, it was very much designed um, uh, after the Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs show, which ran between uh, 1956 to 1962 from the Grand Old Opry. And it was a half hour show and they had sponsors and I have sponsors for my show. Uh, occasionally, I'll even have a paid sponsor, but um, uh, I, I just choose people to sponsor. Sometimes it'll be a local fish market or a local uh, auto repair place or ADAP Auto Parts or Toyota Motor Co Car Company, you know, just um, chosen out of thin air. And very much my idea was to have the show be a combination of um, Bob Ross on PBS, the guy <laughs> who paint, and Mr. Rogers. And uh, uh, so it's like Bob Ross and Mr. Rogers with uh, music and sponsors. And without the happy trees. That's right. Little happy tree. No, no, it's pretty, it's pretty happy, but I really wanted a place that was a release for people. So there will be no political discussion or anything like that. No, this is a place you come to just breathe deeply and, uh, uh, and remember that uh, life is both hopeful and joyful. Have you had your music used in TV show before? Because you've had in television long shows? Time. Yeah. Oh, sure. You know, obviously, uh, uh, our Chesky music has been used in various uh, places. And uh, I've, I've written some other TV themes. Uh, 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 I went through a period in the 80s uh, where I did uh, a lot of commercial work. And, uh, and uh, no, uh, I, plenty of different occasions, Jeff. Oh, very cool. Um, oh, also, before I forget, an early happy birthday to you. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, uh, it is my birthday coming up, and I'm going to be... 21. 77 zero. No, I was born November 21st, 1950. And I remember, I would think to myself as a young boy, cheapers, I'm going to be 50 at the, uh, uh, at the turn of the century. And, uh, and now in 2020, uh, at the tail end of 2020, I'm going to be 70. And I am sure that I speak for everybody who uh, says they uh, hope 2021 is a little bit easier on us <laughs> than 2020 was. Well, I'd say that it can't get much worse, but that's probably not that's oh, too no, foreboding oh, to say. Can, no, 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 no. <laughs> It can get stunningly worse than what it's been, but that's not to say that it hasn't been pretty bad. Do you have any um, birthday celebration plans for so um, much as you can I'm do? Going, uh, uh, it's a good question. I'm going to go do a, uh, uh, a show in Ridgefield, Connecticut tomorrow night. And uh, uh, as of present, it's, uh, it's still going to happen. And uh, all precautions and safety, it'll be a, it'll be a, a, a fraction of their normal audience. And uh, I think it'll be fine. And so now, in addition to your birthday, you also have a special day now in Livingston Taylor Day in, yes. in Boston. Yes. How did that come uh, to they, be? Um, uh, they, it, on my 50th um, year in show business, the governor of uh, Massachusetts and the mayor of Boston de uh, declared it um, Livingston Taylor Day, and I, that was January 17th, if my memory serves me. So that'll be coming up again. Um, uh, it's not, uh, I haven't quite been able to finagle it into a state holiday yet, not to mention a national, but uh, it is celebrated by a, a, a close circle of friends. They didn't give you a key to the city, that kind of a thing? Um, no, no, they, uh, uh, it, it, there, was, there, there was a metaphorical key to the city. <laughs> it opened um, uh, surprisingly few doors. <laughs> so as far as opening doors, take yeah. me back to the start of your career. Obviously, you come from what could, I think, fairly be considered a musical family. So well, how did you carve out your niche? Well, what... 
uh, obviously my my uh, older brother James um, uh, yes he's delighted by the way that it's coming to be my birthday because that means I'm catching up to him but he will scoot ahead of me next March <laughs> anyhow um, uh, it we came up in a time when music late through the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, where music was a rising tide that was lifting all ships. And we rode that tide and uh, uh, have had a fantastic run with it. Um, uh, yes, uh, we uh, wrote and sang, had the ability to be on stage, were joyful on stage, and people came back and watched us play. What was it like in the household learning music where everyone was sort of doing things a little bit their own way, but also just having everyone being such a musical family? Well, I think that uh, certainly musical environments improve, uh, uh, improve, um, let me back up. Great art is the result of uh, concentrated talent. And so uh, if you've got a lot of people playing, and I was playing, my brother Alex, my sister Kate, um, my parents were very musical. And, th and yes, it, uh, we were all bringing the best ingredients we could find into that mix. And now looking back too on your first couple of records, your producers now just recently entered into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Ah. My first producer was a guy named John Landau, J-O-N-L-A-N-D-A-U. And John produced my first two records. And, uh, and I, I met John probably when I was 17 and he said, I, I want to produce you. And so uh, the stars lined up and he did. And he's gone on to have a really illustrious career, arguably, his management of Bruce Springsteen has been one of the most successful artist manager relationships. Uh, uh, Elvis Presley and Colonel Tom Parker are a storied relationship, but John Landau and Bruce Springsteen are a remarkable team. And it can be difficult, you know, different personalities and also trying to blend the art and the commerce in a way that doesn't upset people. Yeah, well, clearly Bruce and John have found a way and they've remained, uh, they've, they've really remained uh, true uh, to their souls, to their musical souls. And that I think has allowed them to stay together for so long. It's been a great, great partnership. And you and the Chesky brothers also have a very long and storied wow. history. How do they come into your story? Well, David and Norman, I'm trying to think, I guess it was Norman who approached me one time and approached me now, what, close to 30 years ago, maybe even more, Jeff. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, certainly they approached me uh, and it is very difficult to express uh, my love for Norman and David. They've been such ferocious advocates of who I am and what I am. Uh, they've been enthusiastic about my career, about my musical adventures. Uh, some of them have gone very well. Others have been uh, 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 less successful, but Always, when I bring them stuff, they are enthusiastic about my vision first. Now, occasionally they need to direct me away from the edge of the cliff, but uh, that notwithstanding, their advocacy for not only me, but for their other artists, they are, they are truly wonderful uh, music people. I would say record people, but it needs to be expanded. Music people. 
They found a niche in terms of audiophile and their passion for that. And it's just been, uh, it's been a true bright spot uh, in my career uh, working with uh, Chesky. One of your most popular tracks on the Chesky record side of things is Isn't She Lovely, where you're covering Stevie Wonder. Uh, the question I have is when, how do you approach things differently when it's a cover song versus an original song? How are you, are you trying to put a spin on it? Are you just trying to interpret it? How are you trying to cover it? Well, I, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. So, um, uh, 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 can I give you an example? Sure. So the the other day, I was thinking. I heard. Um, uh, I'll I'll hear things on the radio or uh, in an elevator. Um, different things that sort of uh, tweak my attention, and then I'll take them and I'll say, "Can I can I make this work?" What will happen is is I'll hear that song. I'll go, "Oh, that's a great pop." record. And then I start playing with it. Can I find a place? Can I find a way in? Can I invent in my brain a story for those lyrics? Can I let the lyrics be carriers for me? Isn't she lovely? That, uh, that came about the same way. I liked it. I started to play it. it and, and I'll play it for a while and I'll just put it down. And then I'll play it a little while longer and, and I'll keep coming back to it. And all of a sudden it just starts making sense. And God, that's fun. When, uh, but, but it doesn't happen quickly and it doesn't happen easily. It takes a lot of time because there are all these details that have to be worked out. There's a huge myriad of problems that need to be solved and they need to be solved uh, accurately and well. And if you can't do it, then uh, uh, if I'll, I'll run into a, a problem that I can't solve and then I have to figure out um, uh, uh, whether I, uh, whether uh, the song bears going back after, uh, uh, and and can I solve the problem? I think. Do you still play? Isn't she lovely live when you do shows? Oh gosh, I do it all the time. I don't do it every night, but oh, I do it uh, every third night for sure. And what I do with "Isn't She Lovely" is I just uh, hold on. Somebody's calling me, and I'm going to uh, turn them off. Um, what I do uh, with uh, Isn't She Lovely or similar songs is I morph them in to another song. So I don't force people to have to respond to a song that they're very familiar with and are bringing other scenarios to. It may be a song that somebody heard when they were uh, uh, breaking up with a significant other. Uh, it may be, um, uh, 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 it, it, it comes, because it's so well known, it comes with a whole list, potentially, of feelings. So I don't, uh, what I would do is take Isn't She Lovely and just morph it into a song of my own. And, uh, uh, and that's how I uh, avoid running the risk of somebody uh, being left alone with conflicting emotions. It, they say that se the sense of smell triggers memory better than any other sense, but for me, it's always sound. He hearing a song takes me back somewhere a lot sooner than smelling something does. But. I think I agree with you completely. So how do you decide when you're doing a show, when you have so much material to choose from, which songs you're going to play every night? You know, it's, it's a... Uh, uh, songs tend to morph in and morph out. So I have a set list, uh, but, but although I know hundreds of songs, um, my, uh, uh, my set list is changing uh, as though it were a, 
a tidal bay. It goes up and down, but not all the water is replaced every time. So it's, it's, I have themes that I build on and things that I'm comfortable with. And then I sort of fold in other stuff and other things will drift out after a few, uh, after a few months or sometimes a few years and other things will drift in and I'll just find that I'm enjoying playing those. And then mentally I will go to another place and those things will just get sort of eased out. And all of a sudden I'll look and say, well, cheapers, I haven't played that song in six months, eight months, a year, a year and a half. And sometimes I'll throw it back in again, but it's very much a drift and a flow. It's not, um, uh, it's, it's not that I'm sitting down before a show with a, uh, a list of songs and making up a set list. And at some point, you have to forget the lyrics to something. How do you handle that? Oh, it's very funny. Uh, one, of, one of the things I, I love to do is, is I'll be playing and I'll uh, forget the lyric. And so I'll just keep playing. And so I, I just... Uh, And I'll, so I'll look at the crowd and I'll go, you know, uh, sometimes people ask me, how do you remember all those lyrics? Well, now you know. I don't. <laughs> Not to worry. They'll show up again soon enough. And I'll go, oh, here they are. And then I'll just continue on with the song. And... Uh, uh, but if I really have forgotten them and I can't find them, I just pick up at a different place in the tune and move on. No, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the things you get to do in your 70s, um, in your 60s, uh, you get to uh, forgive others. And uh, in your 70s, you get to forgive yourself. Mm. Mm. So you, you steer into the skid, essentially. Yeah, basically, it's okay. I forgot a lyric. Nobody died here. This is fine. Um, this stuff happens. Um, yeah. And you've obviously spent a great deal of your career teaching as well. Um, and yes. you, you've had some incredibly successful alums also. I, I have. Guess, are you able to tell when you see them as a student, like some of them particularly, can you tell, oh, that's, that's a star in waiting? You know, uh, a star in waiting doesn't exist. As, as I'm fond of saying to people who say, ooh, that's a hit record when they listen to a song, I go, no, no. A hit record is uh, uh, above number 10 in Billboard's Hot 100 chart. That's a hit record. This is a potential hit record. No, the ability to, it, it requires, Jeff, such an amazing alignment of stars and uh, opportunity, et cetera, to actually get a hit record that uh, I have no ability to predict which of my students will break through that way. Now, there are some, Charlie Puth is an example of a uh, contemporary pop music uh, force that, um, that had very good promise. And if somebody had said to me, do you think he'll break through? I would have said he has a good chance of doing that. But again, lots of things have to line up. Yeah, I think tenacity probably being one of the most of them because it's incredibly there, easy to give up trying to be a musician. Is, the, the thing that people don't realize is that everybody fails at the same rate. We fail at a rate of 40 to one. That means you're going to get it wrong 39 times and you're going to get it right on the 40th. And everybody's working with that same ratio. The difference between successful and not successful is just as you suggested. Tenacity. Oh, I failed again. That's okay. Let's stay at it. Yeah, Hall of Fame baseball players fail seven out of ten times. Yes, that's right. 
So you're going to get it wrong a lot. And it's going to appear as though others don't get it wrong as much as you. And that is covered by the phrase. Um, success has a thousand parents. Failure is an orphan. Nobody speaks about their failures. They speak about their successes and it looks like they've been more successful than you. And the answer is they haven't been. They've stayed at it. Stay at it. I do think we don't put enough of a, a premium on failure because for me, whenever I, I've, whenever I speak to people about things and they they're impressed by any degree of knowledge, it's always like, okay, well, understand that I'm, I learned that by making that mistake. My wisdom today came from my stupidity yesterday. Oh, that's so beautifully said, Jeff. My wisdom today is a result of my stupidity yesterday. Perfect. Because it's one, it feel like it's one thing to, if an elder tells you, hey, you should really avoid X, Y, and Z, and you kind of, okay, yeah. But then when you yourself make that mistake, it, it rings true a lot quicker. Well, you can tell a young person to check the oil in their car, and eventually... They will run their car out of oil. They will destroy the engine. Someone will charge them $4,000 to fix it, and they will never do it again. So obviously you talked a little bit about what it was like being a musician in the 70s as opposed to now. What would you say has changed the most over that time, whether it's the business, the technology? Well, the great difficulty that we have today is that the, uh, uh, I believe that great art is the result of wealth concentrating talent. And the great problem that we have today, Jeff, is that um, the internet eviscerated the revenue streams that allowed competent gatekeepers to concentrate talent. And so now everybody has access and the, uh, the resultant flood of mediocrity is exhausting. Great art is wealth concentrating talent. You need, you need to put into one space, into one area, uh, the best there are. Then they will compete with one another and you will go to very high levels indeed. Yeah, the democratization of music has definitely made their uh, much greater supply. There's something like 40,000 songs being added to Spotify every day yeah. now. Whereas I feel like back in the 70s and 80s, you probably had maybe, what, 100 new records a week? Well, you had 100 records a week, but imagine what it took to right. get uh, your music squeezed into vinyl. God, you had to make a demo. And after you made the demo, then you had to uh, 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 sell the demo. Then you had to record the record. Then you had to master the record, and then you had to put it into a, a, a machine that had two dies that would squeeze down and squeeze hot vinyl and then trim it and package it and send it. No, and every one of those places had a gatekeeper that said, am I going to let you through? Is this justify letting you further down the trail? And those gatekeepers were there and they weren't your parents. Right. There's a degree of, there's a lot of people making music that it's not going to be their life's work. And that does cloud. There's only so much media that a person can consume. So to ask each individual person to gatekeep, there's going to be a lot of stuff that they don't get to hear. Well, they can't gatekeep because they have no uh, a competence to gatekeep. They, they don't know what good is. They wouldn't know what good is if it drove over them in a pickup truck. Um, uh, it, it, 
it takes a very unique person. It takes a Norman, uh, a Chesky, a David Chesky to say, I'm going to, I like this and I'm going to support it. And I'm going to advocate for it. That is a very unique person that can do that and back it up with money. Well, when I try to explain the A and R process to people who don't work in music, it's like I think to a de- to a degree everyone knows what they personally like and don't like, but then it's okay. But now put your rent check or your your mortgage yeah. payment on the line to support your claim, because that's essentially what you're asking the professionals to do. No question. So it's the personal the skin in the game. I think takes it from just being a musical fan to an actual invested and is this going to work or not. No, gatekeepers are what were eviscerated by the internet and our loss of gatekeepers, not only in music, but throughout society has been very, very disruptive. Um, uh, I don't need to tell you, read the New York Times. But at the same time, recording technology has become more readily available, cheaper. Do you find that to be beneficial to the music making process for you? Interesting question. No. What, what matters is a great melody and a great story. Getting those uh, that, that I can record mediocrity and send it out quickly, that doesn't improve who I am or what I am. No, you need to wait. You need to develop it, to write it, to live with it, to hone it, to shift it. To, uh, uh, don't, don't record things quickly. Uh, gosh. Uh, and certainly, if you record them, don't send them out to other people. Oh, you know, it just, just wait. Wait a week, a month, a year, five years. Wait and make sure that what you're sending is, um, uh, has value. So you don't have like a home setup or anything where you work out demos before going into the studio? Sure. Okay. Right there. Oh. That's enough. Yeah. What do you need? What do you need more than this? You know, I got a phone. Um, uh, it, it, the it, the the it, if the storyline of the lyric is a good one, what do you need more than that? It's uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does go back to the saying that's you know the ear, not not the gear, but yeah. But, oh, I like that. Yeah, that's good. It's the ear, not the gear. And it's always been that way. Come on. Is, is, uh, uh, are, are people with all their modern gear and technique, are they making a, a, a better record than Steely Dan made when they made Asia? Or, or, uh, uh, or the, the Beatles or four track? Um, uh, with a four-track recording, uh, making Sgt. Pepper's uh, Lonely Hearts Club Band. No, uh, uh, a, a mentor of mine, Charlie Koppelman, Charlie Koppelman said it loud and clear. It's the song. Everything is in the song. Yeah, I think it depends on how you're using the technology. If it's if you're using it as a crutch, so if you're just like you're using Melodyne to fix the vocal that you couldn't sing correctly the first time around, then that's one thing. But you also have folks like Trent Reznor who are using the technology as an instrument unto itself. Yes. So I think there's no question. And and listen, there's wonderful expression in that. You're you're right, and and uh, I I agree with you, Jeff. Um, uh, that said, uh, it is. The, what has been facilitated is the creation of and distribution of stunning quantities of mediocrity. It's made it so you don't even necessarily have to have the ability to sing and sing with autotune, melodyne, and you can chop everything up. You really don't actually have to execute the song perfectly to record it anymore. No, no, you don't. So, is Chesky the only 
recordings or the Chesky recordings, the only ones that you've done on a single microphone? That is, uh, yes, for release that way. And uh, I love recording uh, on, onto a single microphone with uh, great players, but the real, uh, the, 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 the single microphone uh, is, uh, uh, I, it, it would, what I love is having the great players and the great material in that moment. Uh, it, I would have been more than happy, Jeff, with, uh, uh, with um, if, if we had had five microphones, it wouldn't have made a, a big difference to me. That's because uh, what I wanted was the song and the players that we had, but uh, for, uh, for Chesky in the, in, in the engineering aspect of it, for them to work their magic, which, which I'm not so familiar with, they needed that one microphone and, and, and what that does and the reverberation of the room, et cetera. That's how you get to work uh, your magic. Um, uh, I work mine with song choice and musician choice. It's also, it's essentially takes the process, the mixing process and does it backward instead of recording everything and then figuring out where does it sit in the field. You're actually, if you want to move the guitar player to the left, he physically gets up and moves to the left. No, no it's so, it's, it's a beautiful way to record and I love doing it. Yeah. Does it pose, does that pose any unique challenges to you? Knowing that everyone is on one mic, it's all in one take. Nobody's going to punch in individual parts. If you could, you could punch in the entire band, but not, you know, yeah. the bass line got messed up. It's, again, there are advantages to both. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, I think when I've written a fistful of new songs and I don't know where they are or what they're doing, the notion of being able to change a bass part around as, as, as I get new awarenesses of the songs. Um, uh, but that said, I'd be, uh, that's where multi-track recording really shines, but I would be more than happy to do those uh, on a single microphone with one take. Some artists are comfortable with that sort of stuff and I'm one of them. So instead of asking you the question, the way of what's your favorite song you've written, I'll ask it this way. What's the song that you've written that never gets, you never get tired of playing, never gets old, still feels the same way now the first time you wrote it? Well, I love, there's a song I wrote called Yes, which is kind of this uh, R&B-ish sort of song. And I, I, I really like uh, uh, Yes. There's another, but when it comes to just... Uh, a, a, a truly uh, exceptional piece of writing. Um, I've written three or four of those. There's a song I wrote called Walk Until It's Heaven. And uh, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a very, uh, that's a very, very high level piece of writing. And, uh, and I know it to be that it's, uh, uh, yeah, that's a good one. Is there a song written by someone else that not that it sounds like one of your songs, but that mm -hmm. you feel like, Oh, that's, that person really took something out of my head or my heart. And that feels like something I would have written. Well, I, I think that there are, uh, different levels of that to me, the great, touchstone of modern popular song. The, uh, the great, uh, 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 the song by uh, uh, George and Ira Gershwin, Someone to Watch Over Me. That is a very, very strong piece of writing. It's beautiful, it's balanced, it, 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 it is the right size. Uh, that's an exceptional piece of writing. 
there are flashes of brilliance in other places. Uh, uh, my brother James, uh, uh, Sweet Baby James, the first verse in Sweet Baby James is a remarkable um, definition of who and what he is and what his career became. Um, uh, uh, Jimmy Buffett, Margaritaville, same things, the same thing. These songs defined, Margaritaville defined Jimmy Buffett's career. Sweet Baby James defined James Taylor's career. And, uh, uh, and James and Jimmy have both played in that model for their entire career. But that is, uh, uh, you know, it's Bob Hope. Thanks for the memories. Da, 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 da. Um, that's, it, it, that's not necessarily great, uh, uh, a, a great song. Carol King writes a fully complete song with You've Got a Friend or You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman. I mean, these are great, uh, uh, technically assembled uh, uh, parts, all perfect, all the right size uh, songs. So uh, uh, different ones do different things. But certainly for me, in my early years, uh, 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 good Friends, in my earliest writing, Good Friends was a great song. And in my uh, later years, Walk Until It's Heaven, um, uh, Yes is a great song, Tell Jesus to Come to My House, Step by Step. These, these are all very, very strong pieces of work. Answer My Prayer that I wrote with Carol Bear Sager, that's a very, very serious uh, uh, piece of writing. Obviously, we're not soothsayers, but where do you think musically we go from here with everything that's going on? Oh, I think that we have uh, drifted um, through uh, the golden age of, uh, of pop music. And now what we're doing is we're just taking uh, the, way, the way classical music goes back to Beethoven and Bach and Debussy and, and uh, uh, Mozart, etc., and recycles that. I think we're essentially just recycling that which was done in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that golden era, which all built on the uh, 20s, 30s, uh, uh, 40s, uh, that uh, uh, that infrastructure. Uh, I don't think we're going to have another golden age of music until we reestablish a revenue stream which will reestablish gatekeepers that will weed out the mediocrity. No, great art is wealth concentrating talent and you need gatekeepers who control the wealth to concentrate the talent. And when that happens, we will have another golden age. Uh, until then, we're going to recycle the music from when that was, uh, uh, when that was a reality, when gatekeepers were assembling talent. So, what do you have coming up? Obviously, you have the digital shows. Is there anything else you have in the pipeline? Yeah, what I have coming up is a great deal of enthusiasm about, a, um, about the fading of COVID, about us getting back together, about seeing my beautiful audience, about being gathered tightly into one place or another. It's going to come slowly, but it is going to come. It's going to come starting, we've got a few months of very difficult winter of 2000, 2020, 2021. Those are going to be tough, tough months, but spring is going to come starting in early March. And from then on, the, uh, we will be through COVID and uh, 
we will uh, find ourselves uh, strong and uh, uh, back to the best parts of what we were. Where can everyone find you online to get updated on when you're back out playing shows, where oh, to catch you your online just, shows? You just throw Livingston Taylor into any search engine you wish, and it will take and find me, and uh, uh, you'll find my website and all you need to know. All right. I'm, thank you for having us, Liv. Oh, Jeff, what a joy to speak with you, and uh, uh, thank you for letting me mouth off for a while. All right, you stay safe and healthy. Thanks, my, my love for, uh, to everybody at Chesky. <laughs>